I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York. An adorable five-year-old <laughs> suffering from a mysterious illness. We were told he has celiac disease, Crohn's disease. His worried mother on a desperate search for answers. He meant the world to her, and she was a loving mother. Or was she? Nobody could really put their finger on what she was doing. Soon sympathies turned to suspicions. And a doting mother begins to look like the devil. What did that say to you? That she's a liar. Inside the case of Lacey Spears. Something was poisoning this kid, and Something. somebody was putting it in his system. And what cops say happened behind a hospital door that shocked everyone. What do you believe happened in that bathroom? Then, a boy's weekend on the water ends in a horrible tragedy. His last words were, oh my god. An all-American football star winds up in a life vest in handcuffs. It's like he's in a straitjacket. Then sinks into the lake like a stone. Was it an accident? He didn't try to save my son's life. Who does that? Who does that? Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. This. I'm Elizabeth. I'm here with Crime Watch. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. Is Crime Watch oh, Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. First up, my all-new investigation into the blockbuster case of Lacey Spears. It all starts when the Kentucky mother sets off on a desperate journey to find a cure for her son's unexplained illnesses. But was she trying to help him get better, or was she the one making him so sick he would eventually die? Nana. Nana. Papa. Na papa. A young mother. He meant the world to her, and she was a loving mother. A sick child. He's curled up in a ball in a tremendous amount of pain. But was it an unexplained illness? There were red flags, obviously. Or prolonged torture. It's something that will haunt me. All leading to this horrific discovery. We actually had to watch a video of a five-year-old child being murdered. Lacey Spears grew up in Decatur, Alabama. And this all-American girl loved American Girl dolls. And she would live through them. She would have them everywhere. She would clothe them. And it was kind of more than the usual little girl and doll. But for Lacey, it seemed to be a much bigger thing. Soon, Lacey's love of dolls grew into a profound love for real children, too. She always wanted to be looking after children. And when she left school, she went into childcare. And when she started taking care of children, People would notice how much more time she would spend with the children than everyone else. Right away, Lacey wanted children of her own. And her dreams came true when she got pregnant and gave birth to a beautiful little boy she named Garnett. But motherhood got off to a rocky start when at just nine days old, Garnett became so ill that he had to be hospitalized. Within days, she was taking him to hospital and complaining that he wasn't eating and he was failing to thrive and he was getting all these infections and everything. This will be just one of dozens of trips they will make to the doctor to address Garnett's growing list of mysterious health issues. The doctors were baffled by the various things that, you know, she had Crohn's disease. She said uh, Garnett had uh, many other diseases which were inexplicable. Most notably, Lacey told doctors that Garnett would not eat. Then this unusual request. Now he had a feeding tube at one point. That was uh, put in about when he was eight months old. She asked to be have a feeding tube put in because she said he was a failure to thrive child. She went to various doctors and hospitals. Many of them were very hesitant to put a feeding tube in, but eventually she found one doctor that did. But Lacey didn't stop there with her son's surgeries. And he also had another procedure to close up his throat so he couldn't regurgitate or be sick. That's right. Now, Garnett will be fed through a tube and is no longer able to throw up. His little body is forced to ingest everything his mother is feeding him. She wanted to be able to control what he ate. She would say, in fact, that uh, she wanted to protect him because he just couldn't eat many foods that everyone else can eat. So uh, she wanted to protect him and give him juices 
and fresh, you know, vegetables and things like that. In from Garnett's daily diet to his frequent hospital visits, it was all documented on Lacey's multiple social media websites. It appeared that this growing online community is where this young single mom turned for support, comfort, and sympathy. Lacey even kept a detailed blog called Garnett's Journey, as seen here in one update she wrote. September, what a month, and it's only half over. Garnett has enjoyed driving his tractor through our neighborhood, playing in the rain, riding his bike for hours, and we spent a few days in the hospital. And despite Garnett's laundry list of medical treatments... Was Garnett actually a sick kid? According to Lacey, he was a very sick kid. Uh, everybody else never saw any of that. You know, Lacey would say he wouldn't eat. He was a failure to thrive child. Now, Garnett has visited 20 different medical facilities, but Lacey claims there is still no relief for her little boy. Appearing desperate for a cure, Lacey and her son move to Florida. There, she discovers a possible solution for her son's medical needs. When Lacey said she wanted to change her son's diet over to a holistic diet, she was introduced to some people that said, you know, this is a place where the way they live fits the diet that we think your son might thrive with. Looking for the ultimate in holistic food, Lacey and Garnett move again, this time to the secluded area of Chestnut Ridge, New York, to a place called the Fellowship Community, with a focus on sustainable living and a farm-to-table diet. I mean, she came into the Fellowship Community and she told everyone about uh, Garnett, the terrible illnesses he'd had over his life. There were a lot of people that, you know, were convinced that uh, Lacey was a great mother, you know, she looked after Garnett. Lacey and Garnett are welcomed with open arms. Garnett, now a lively and happy little five-year-old boy, begins to make friends and hang out with other families. Then the oddest thing starts to happen. Whenever he'd be with other, you know, friends or they'd take him to the local diner and he'd wolf as much as he could. He always asked for seconds or thirds. He was hungry. Yeah, he was hungry. And by many accounts, a normal kid. Yeah, he had a very, very healthy appetite according to many of the friends that, you know, used to see him. But Lacey would say he never ate. Eyebrows begin to rise. Lacey's new neighbors aren't seeing any of the signs of the sick child she's chatted about all these years on her social media accounts. But their suspicion turns to sympathy when Lacey shares some devastating news. You know, initially she had told me that her fiancé, the baby's father, Blake, um, had perished. He was a former policeman who was killed in a tragic car accident. Blake's death appeared to be heartbreaking for Lacey, as seen on our blog post. Lacey wrote, November, celebrated Garnett's first Thanksgiving home and our first without Daddy Blake. And then this solemn post. December, Christmas, G's first spent at home. Our home was quite still and simple. Christmas wasn't Christmas without Daddy Blake. As the community of Chestnut Ridge rallies around Lacey, new questions surface about their new neighbor and her ailing son. And there were certain suspicions that something was going on, but nobody could really put their finger on what she was doing. Up next, Garnett's appetite appears to be growing stronger. Eat everything. What did that say to you? That she's a liar. And the shocker about his dad's death. Daddy Blake. Daddy Blake. Five-year-old Garnett had been battling unexplained health problems all his life, a fight his mom, Lacey Spears, wrote about on her blog. But when the little boy lay dying in the hospital, police would suddenly realize something odd about his illnesses, and what they found inside his mom's home would shock everyone. Young mother Lacey Spears has been searching for answers for her chronically sick five-year-old son, Garnett. Now living in the tight-knit area of Chestnut Ridge, New York, people in the community become suspicious. She told everyone about uh, Garnett, the terrible uh, illnesses he'd had over his life, how he was a failure to thrive child who had all these various diseases and couldn't eat. They'd take him out to a diner and they'd see him eat, you know, double portions or whatever. And things started not to add up. But Lacey is adamant that something is very wrong with her son's health. And on one afternoon, following symptoms of a high fever, severe headache, and convulsions, Lacey rushes Garnett to the hospital. 
It's Friday when they check in. The mother complained that he was having seizures. They hooked him up to an EEG. Uh, the first day, there is no seizure. And no seizure activity on Saturday or Sunday. According to the medical staff, five-year-old Garnett is the picture of health. Sunday morning comes. The nurse comes in with some great news for Lacey that Garnett had no seizure activity. He most likely would be going home. Then just moments after the nurses and doctors leave Garnett's hospital room. A young boy who's bouncing in the bed one moment and within 10 minutes, deathly ill. Lacey gives a play-by-play -play on her Facebook page with this post. Please, please send G some love. Went from fine to really sick in minutes. Then a tragic turn for the worse that no one saw coming. Essentially, the child was brain dead. Again, Lacey takes to Facebook. My sweet baby Garnett has been declared brain dead. It can't even be possible. That's my baby boy. I'm not ready to let him go. Doctors treating Garnett can't find a medical explanation for his current grave condition. Alarmed by the suspicious circumstances, they call the police. The only information that I received from my supervisor was that uh, there was a child that was apparently on life support, and um, there were some unusual circumstances surrounding the case. Blood tests show Garnett has a lethal amount of sodium in his system. But how in the world did it get there? Not naturally, according to doctors. Something was poisoning this kid and Some... somebody was putting it in his system. That's correct. Who did you think that someone was? Well, I mean, obviously, the caregiver is the mother. Right away, Lacey is interviewed by police. No immediate flags. I wanted to hear her story. Her story made sense. It made a lot of sense. She, um, she spoke pretty well. She had uh, pretty good working knowledge of uh, hospital terms and, and um, illnesses. At that exact moment, I had no reason not to believe what she was telling me. According to investigators, they had to wonder if this was simply a tragic story of a young mother who has just lost her sick child. Detectives had to consider that maybe the doctors got it wrong. During that same interview with Detective Carfee, Lacey mentions the recent passing of Garnett's father, Blake. Around this same time, Lacey's own father arrives at the hospital. I introduced myself, shook his hand, told him who I was, and I told him that I was very sorry about the passing of Blake, Garnett's father. And he said to me, who's Blake? Daddy Blake. Daddy Blake. Who was not the father. Who was not the father. Who did not die in a tragic accident. No. Ends up Blake Robinson is alive and well and working as a Morgan County Sheriff's deputy in Alabama. Did he have any idea that Lacey was using pictures of him or someone she claimed to be him, calling him Daddy Blake, and she manufactured this entire story? No, not until I called him. Blake tells police he went out on a couple of dates with Lacey, nothing serious or sexual. For me, that was the most, the biggest red flag, if you will, about Lacey's truthfulness. Investigators wonder if she lied about Garnett's father what else might she be lying about? Police obtain a search warrant for Lacey's apartment. When you executed the search warrant at her apartment, what did you find? When we walked in, there was a open setting kind of apartment. In the middle of it was a feeding machine pump with what appeared to me to be breast milk in a feeding bag. And right next to the feeding bag, and there was a small table off to the side. It had all the medications that she had told us. There was like seven, eight medications that she told Detective Carvey that she was currently giving her son, lined up on the table. And in the middle of those was a sea salt container. Sea salt. Sea salt. Please photograph the apartment. Then they receive a game-changing phone call. It's shocking information coming from Lacey's neighbor, Valerie Plouchet. Lacey had placed a phone call to her, and the phone call was, can you go to my apartment, take the feeding bag that's on the feeding machine, get rid of it, and don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Correct. Detectives recover the feeding bag in a second bag from the trash. 
Well, they were submitted to the Westchester County lab for analysis, and uh, an astronomical high level of sodium was found in those bags. Sodium? Correct. And he suffered sodium poisoning? Correct. Police collect 170 items from Lacey's apartment and question her again. What was her demeanor? Uh, she would come into the room crying hysterical, put her head down, and when we talked to her, I, she would just look up there'd be no tears. Investigators start digging. They discover a parent paper trail from hell. Dozens of records from Child Protective Services and doctor's offices from Alabama and Florida. Detectives begin to see a pattern of what they believe to be child abuse in one of the rarest forms. Had you heard of Munchausen's by proxy before this investigation? Truthfully, no. I've heard of caregivers harming children, but the actual term, no. Investigators start to build their case, believing Lacey was poisoning her son and then posting it all over social media to grab attention and sympathy. Though she and her lawyers deny Spears suffers from any mental health disorder, Lacey seems to be the poster child for Munchausen by proxy. But how did she get away with this for so long? If someone were to catch on to her or they would try to investigate her, she'd move along. She knew how to play the system when Child Protective Service in Alabama and Florida both were investigating her. She would move along. She knew when it was getting too hot for her to be there, it was time to move. But the buck stops in New York. Now, investigators just need solid proof more than just tainted feeding bags and a canister of salt. If only cops could catch Lacey red-handed, or perhaps they already have. She goes, well, where's the video to that? I didn't know there was a video. Well, who knew? I didn't know the machine was hooked up to video. Up next, an unbelievable find. It's something that will haunt me. The last few minutes of little Garnett's life frame by frame. We actually had to watch a video of a five-year-old child being murdered. New York investigators suspect Lacey Spears has just killed her own five-year-old son. The boy dying just hours after doctors in this hospital gave him a clean bill of health. Cops claim Spears poisoned her son with lethal levels of salt. And now they believe they have proof. Actual videotape of the heartbreaking murder doing an interview with Garnett's kindergarten teacher, who also happened to be a nurse. We had talked to her several times before, and on this one occasion, we were discussing that things had happened in the hospital, and she said, he was on an EEG, and we said, yes, he was. She goes, well, where's the video to that? I didn't know there was a video. Well, who knew? I didn't know the machine was hooked up to video. Yes, video. Frame by frame, the final moments of Garnett's life. We want to warn you, some of the images are graphic. The video begins when Garnett checks in on Friday, and it records through Sunday when doctors and nurses tell Lacey that Garnett is healthy enough to go home. After medical personnel leave the room, Lacey appears to take Garnett to the bathroom, just outside of camera range. But when they come back into frame... When he came back out of that bathroom, a few seconds, minutes, he turned into the most sick, child burying his head into the bed the pillow turning retching he was trying to throw up but we've already know that he couldn't throw up because at nine months old he had an operation that kept him from throwing up it's something that will haunt me it was probably the, it's the worst video it's we actually had to watch a video of a five-year-old child being murdered Lacey is arrested and charged with murder. You actually were the I one, was the actual who, one arrested who arrested Lacey. Lacey. And what did she say to you? She didn't say anything. She was instructed not to say a word by her attorney. Lacey's defense team argued she didn't poison her son with salt. I think that she felt in her heart she was going to get away with this. Really? Yes. What made you think that? I don't know. I don't know if it was something her attorneys were telling her, but I think that she thought she might be able to get away with this. You were in the courtroom. I was. Describe Lacey's demeanor. It was uh, different each day. Um, 
I, I think uh, she looked a little scared one time. She looked mad at other times. And um, once or twice she cried a little bit. But in court, prosecutors slowed down that video to show what appears to be a feeding tube and some substance in Lacey's hands when she returned from the bathroom with her five-year-old son. Prosecutors claim that just off camera in the bathroom, Lacey gave Garnett a lethal dose of salt, which moments later caused his brain to swell and ultimately killed him. But there's more. The videotape evidence also shows Lacey on her phone doing Google searches. She had been on the phone laying in the bed and we observed that. Some of those searches were salt poisoning. Salt poisoning? Salt poisoning. On the phone at the time? On the phone, we can connect the time of the phone to the video and the search that she was doing. Unimaginable, while her precious little boy lies next to her, authorities say she's researching how to kill him. He had a right to grow up and a right to grow old, and she stole that from him. She committed the ultimate betrayal that a mother can do. She was supposed to love him, nurture him, care for him, and protect him. And she did the complete opposite, and she killed him. Lacey Spears is found guilty of depraved indifference murder of a child. Instead of nurturing and protecting a beautiful child, you subjected him to five years of torment and pain. One does not have to be a psychologist to realize you suffer from a mental illness known as Munchausen by proxy. What does this video indicate to you? Well, watching it uh, in court, uh, it was brought tears to many of the jurors. How important was that video in this case? I, I think uh, between the video and the, and the amount of salt found in the feeding bags were the, were the uh, icing on the cake, if you will. She's sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Is she a cold-blooded killer? I believe she is. She sat in that hospital room when her child coded and watched him die. She watched his life slip away when there's a chance that if she would have stepped up and told them what she did, may have changed the outcome. Mama. Papa. Two more notes on this story. When Garnett passed away, his real father, Chris Hill, was devastated and posted this message in part on his Facebook page. I cried for hours when I found this out, and it will continue to hurt till the day I die. And lastly, detectives say that during their six-month investigation, they were deathly afraid that Lacey might be trying to get pregnant again, that some of her online chatter was about trying to have another child. However, thankfully, she was arrested before that could happen. Coming up, a weekend of fun on the lake turns tragic when a young man dies while in police custody. His hands were handcuffed from behind, so he had no mobility. It was like he was in a straitjacket. The officer claims it was an accident. Now, a major development could finally bring his family justice. That's next. What happens when the people you trust the most betray that trust in the worst way? It's a scenario the family of Brandon Ellingson know all too well. We first brought you Brandon's story here on Crime Watch Daily, a young man who was out having a good time on the lake when things would take an unbelievably tragic turn. Well, now there's been a huge development in the controversial case. High school friends back from college. I think it was like the first weekend back. He was, came back from Arizona State. Reuniting for a carefree weekend of boating and beer. I know I had work that weekend. And he's like, no, no you don't. <laughs> yeah. We're going to lake. <laughs> the fun begins at their friend Brandon Ellingson's home on the Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri. So, I mean, he invited me. He told me, he's like, I plan on going to the, and it, with him, it was like, I'm going to the lake this weekend. Let's go. But for Brandon, the weekend would take a dark turn. Ending in a horrible tragedy and a stunning case of possible criminal negligence. Never in our minds were we expecting the situation that had happened, so. Our Andrea Isom is following new dramatic details as Brandon's friends and family are speaking out about the day that would forever be etched in their memory. Brandon was a strapping 20-year-old All-American college student, a champion football player, and beloved son. Being his mom continues to be your greatest joy. Why? Oh, well, I was just blessed to have him in my life. He was a one of a kind. He touched so many people's lives while he was here. 
and I got to be there for every moment of it. Yeah, I don't remember my life without him before it happened, so. Anybody he would come in contact to that was less fortunate than him, he was really kind to. So I think that was probably the biggest thing. You were honored to be his dad. Yes, very much so. I was very lucky. But luck was scarce on the day Brandon and six friends headed to the lake and spent the afternoon at Coconuts, a popular lakeside bar and grill. Tell us what happened that day. Brandon was going to be flying out pretty soon to Europe to study abroad for the summer. So this was his only opportunity to go to, go to the lake. He'd been looking forward to it, and he wanted everything to be perfect for his friends. That day, he'd been out at a restaurant that we went to all the time. Mm -hmm. They were in the pool, and they'd been out eating. They had been playing sand volleyball. Had you guys had a few beers? Had that happen? Yeah, yeah, we were, I mean, casually drinking. It's not like we were belligerent, we passed out, nothing. We ate. I mean, we were, our whole plan was to stay there all day and hang out. I mean, it was, a, it was a great, beautiful day out, so. Yet under the clear blue sky, trouble was looming on the picturesque lake. I'd been down there a week before, and I noticed that the water patrol was all over the place. It just looked like they were looking to write up tickets and that type of thing, because I'd seen a few boats pull over. So anyway, when he was going down, I let him know that he needed to really watch out for that and uh, be careful. Sure enough, as the guys leave the bar with plans for Brandon to operate the boat, Missouri Highway Patrol Officer Anthony Piercy zeroes in. Friends believe Piercy was just waiting to pounce. Tony Piercy had spent the afternoon basically staking out this place, looking for somebody to pull over. And it didn't take long. Within minutes of leaving Coconuts, with Brandon at the helm, Trooper Piercy busts him on suspicion of boating while intoxicated. He was the first person to see the cop when he was behind us, and he was like, hey, can you guys, like, be cooperative, sit down, behave? Brandon took charge when we got pulled over and told us to just chill out because everything's going to be fine. No, it wasn't. The officer quickly ushers Brandon to the police boat. The arrest can be seen here in a picture snapped by one of Brandon's buddies. Trooper Piercy first does a field test then puts Brandon in handcuffs and throws a life vest over his arms cuffed behind his back. But tragically, that life vest would soon become a cloak of death, and this photo image, the last taken of Brandon alive. You guys saw Anthony Piercy put the life jacket on Brandon. Yeah. Describe that. I mean, right from the get-and-go, it just didn't look right. It was already strapped up. It's one of those life jackets where you gotta put your arms, arms through. through. Yeah. yeah, it was definitely not on properly at all. What's the point of even having a life jacket at that point? Like, it was so bizarre. His hands were handcuffed from behind, so he had no mobility. It was like he was in a straight jacket. Brandon's friends say Officer Piercy then quickly speeds off with Brandon in custody, leaving the other boys behind. The Lake of the Ozarks is a huge place, and he didn't even ask if anybody really knew how to operate the boat or how to get there. None of those boys were from there. They didn't know the lake. Luckily, one of our friends actually owns a boat, and he's comfortable with driving a boat. Our plan was to follow him to the h toad yeah. And it hadn't been 30 seconds by the time we got all, all figured out, situated, and he was gone. We had no idea where he went. Out on the lake and out of sight, a simple misdemeanor arrest was about to go tragically wrong. While racing along the lake surface, Brandon is sitting in the right front seat his hands cuffed behind his back, and his feet off the deck. Then, according to Piercy, his patrol boat hit another boat's wake. The impact so strong, Brandon flies overboard. And Piercy radios headquarters saying Brandon may have jumped. I can't say 100% for sure if he did it on purpose or if it was the wake. Now in the water, Brandon's life vest slips off, floating to the surface. But his hands are still cuffed behind his back, and he's sinking fast. He just had no uh, way to protect himself, and out he went. He treaded water for three to four minutes. Next, tragedy on the lake. I don't want this to happen to any other family. Was it just an innocent accident? Brandon's family says it's a cover-up. You don't cover up if there's an accident. You just don't. There were way too many people's hands in this that did wrong.
one minute, Brandon Ellingson was out with his buddies having fun while boating on the Lake of the Ozarks. The next, he was handcuffed in custody on a sheriff's boat heading back to shore. But what happened next was not only tragic, many feel it's criminal. Andrea Isom is back with our all new investigation. Brandon Ellingson and six buddies were out for a party filled reunion on the Lake of the Ozarks. But shortly after they left a local bar and grill, the fun came to a crushing end. Brandon knew that he had done wrong because he'd had a drink and he was underage. He did not feel like he was inebriated, according to his friends. But Brandon is pulled over by Trooper Anthony Piercy for boating while intoxicated. Never in our minds were we expecting the situation that had happened, so. Brandon's friends and family tell our Andre Isom that it all began when Brandon is handcuffed with his hands behind his back. Then the trooper slips a life vest over him without looping his arms through. A short time later, his parents get the call no one ever wants to hear. How did you find out what happened? My husband called me. I was out to dinner and um, he was in shock because he just said to me, Sherry, Brandon's dead. They soon learned the trooper was heading back to shore when the boat hit a wake, throwing Brandon overboard. The life vest is over his cuffed arms, but it's of no use. It slips right off. He sinks toward the bottom of the lake. Brandon kicks and fights to keep his head above water, but loses his battle and drowns. I can't um, go to sleep at night thinking that um, he thought he was going to die and drown that day. Since that terrible day, Brandon's family believes there has been a cover-up to protect Trooper Piercy. Now, many discrepancies have surfaced with allegations of a conspiracy within the Missouri State Highway and Water Patrol. I've never seen anything like this. It's unbelievable uh, that they would um, act this way. Most of the command staff, if not all of them, have kids. Sergeant Randy Henry used to work this same beat and in fact was Trooper Piercy's supervisor at one time. He bravely came forward, risking his job to expose what he calls a cover-up in Brandon's death. We killed Brandon Ellingson. The alleged lies covering up the travesty of Brandon's death start with this radio call from Piercy to another officer, saying that he was driving the patrol boat at a safe speed. I wouldn't go real fast to the real cop. But the patrol boat GPS tells a different story. Data reveals he hit speeds of up to 46 miles an hour while Brandon was in custody. And the reason Piercy was speeding? Sergeant Henry says he thinks it's because the more tickets a trooper writes, the better it looks on his record. Yeah, I think this is all about uh, Tony Piercy trying to make a name for himself so he can get promoted. He told me he wanted to be in a position to take my place when I retired to be a sergeant so he can you know, make himself a sergeant before he retires for his retirement pay. As the boat sped along, Piercy admits they hit away. Brandon goes overboard. But when the trooper radios in, he says Brandon may have jumped. I, I can't say 100% for sure if he did it on purpose or if it was the way. But Sergeant Henry says physical evidence on Brandon's body shows he hit hard surfaces inside the boat, suggesting he was thrown forward, then ejected over the right side of the boat. Brandon, he had bruising on his neck area yeah. that was they tried saying in the coroner's inquest that was caused uh, by the needle marks they tried getting blood the only problem with that is dead people don't bruise and when brandon hit the water his life vest slipped off with hands cuffed behind him he didn't stand a chance you're, you're completely submissive to me huh? i'm trapped in here you're trapped there's no way in the world i can get out as soon as you hit the water black chicken comes, comes up, up. Girls at a bachelorette party on a nearby barge witnessed the whole event, reportedly pleading with Piercy to jump in and save Brandon. Sergeant Henry says those girls on the party boat said the trooper waited more than four minutes before jumping in to help. They were stunned and they, they watched Brandon Ellington drown. They witnessed Brandon Ellington take his last breath of air. You know, his last words were, oh my God. That was his last words. And the girls in the party barge boat said that. Knowing that that he didn't try to save your son's life. He didn't try to save my son's life. Who does that? Who does that? But what exactly Piercy was thinking or doing when Brandon was literally dying before his eyes is shrouded in mystery because the camera cards installed to capture activity on the boat are gone.
Those SD cards that should have been in the cameras to mm -hmm. show the truth yeah. without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. Where do you think they are? The bottom of the lake. And tragically, the bottom of the lake is where Brandon was abandoned. Our Columbia, Missouri affiliate KMIZ uncovered this sonar photo where you can actually see his lifeless body 80 feet down. Moments later, you can hear Piercy complain the incident left him worn out. Sore, compared to water with the bastard, but I just put spit. Damn, I thought I was going to marathon. Even more shocking, troopers reportedly told Brandon's friends he would be held overnight in jail and they could get him in the morning. Brandon had already been dead four hours and Missouri Highway and Water Patrol decided not to retrieve his body until the next day. Then, an audio recording reveals they callously joke about it over the radio. Dad is seven times as pissed off so we're not gonna die tonight. Yeah, well. And I wanted to tell him he's not gonna be any more dead in the morning than he is right now. <laughs> Sergeant Randy Henry says he was disgusted by what he heard. As Piercy's immediate supervisor, he interviews the cop after Brandon's death, grilling him about why he didn't use the proper type of life jacket that would have held Brandon afloat. Words where he had a brain fart. That he just grabbed the first like it, the life jacket he could uh, get, because he wanted to get out of there. When Sergeant Henry takes his concerns to his supervisors, he says they tried to muzzle him and didn't even write a report. I upset a lot of people on Highway Patrol, a lot. I mean, my name is, I'm public enemy number one with the Highway Patrol. That's fine. You know, if, uh, I really don't care. The case eventually goes to court. But amazingly, Piercy is given a slap on the wrist, just a five-day suspension. Sergeant Henry was transferred 90 miles away and says he was forced into early retirement. He claims punishment for being a whistleblower and calling attention to problems with the merger of Missouri's Highway and Water Patrol, a cost-cutting measure that allegedly put inexperienced troopers like Piercy on the water. So if you can drive a car, you can drive a boat, and they didn't take it seriously. But someone did take it seriously. A special prosecutor has now charged Piercy with involuntary manslaughter in the first degree, accusing the trooper of recklessly causing the death and taking an unjustifiable risk. A Class C felony that could mean seven years in prison for Piercy. He's pleaded not guilty. What would be justice for Brandon? Well, you know, I'm not going to get Brandon back in my lifetime. But I think, you know, Piercy needs to go to jail for what he did. And the people that were covering this up need, need to be reprimanded or lose their jobs. And the system needs to change. Piercy's trial is yet to get underway as the Ellingson family suffers searing pain over their senseless loss. Brandon would have celebrated his 23rd birthday yesterday. Brandon wanted to get married, have children. He wanted four kids. Um, So that'll be tough, you know, so, you know, his sister's gonna probably get married someday and uh, he won't be there for that, so, but stuff like that. Does it hurt even more knowing that the kind of young man you raised would never do to somebody what somebody did to him? Oh, my son would have given up his life to rescue him. Anyone, a stranger. And to your baby, Brandon, you say what? It's you. <laughs>